morning and welcome everyone to the 14th meeting of, the, of 2019 of the Social Security Committee. I can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and other devices, put them to silent mode so they don't disrupt the meeting. Um, Mark Griffin, MSP, unfortunately, isn't able to join us this morning. He may be able to join us later on, but he's indicated he's unlikely to be able to, to, to do that. And we move to agenda item one, which is decision to take items in private. And the committee is asked to agree to take item three, consideration of evidence to be taken in private. Is the committee agreed to that? <coughs> Excuse me. We now move to agenda item two, which is welfare rights services, and the committee will take evidence in a roundtable format on the provision and funding of welfare rights services. Uh, I've got a general welcome and thanks to, to witnesses today, but um, rather than me introducing everyone, we've got a roundtable format, so why don't we just go around starting with myself and we can all say, say who we are. So, Bob Doris, MSP for Glasgow, Mary Hill and Springburn, and um, convener of the Social Security Committee. Uh, Polly McNeill, MSP for Glasgow Region and Deputy Convener. Can Carrick Evaluation Manager Improvement Service. Stephen McAvoy, a Welfare Rights Advisor with Enable Scotland. Uh, Craig Mason, um, Senior Manager, Council Advice Services, Dundee City Council. Uh, Keith Brown, Member of the Committee and Member for um, Club Manager and Dunblane, and wearing my Enable tie. Hmm. Sean Robson, Member of the Committee and MSP for Dundee City East. Uh, Sandra McDermott, Head of Financial Inclusion and Improving the Cancer Journey in Glasgow City Council. Michelle Ballantyne, a member for the South of Scotland. Kate Burton from the Scottish Public Health Network, which is part of NHS Scotland. Alistair Allen, MSP for the and the the Western Isles. Ali Asiel, Director of Customer Journey at Citizens Advice Scotland. Uh, Jeremy Boff, a member of the committee and Lothian Region, MSP. OK, thanks everyone uh, for coming along, as I say. And, uh, I might just kind of open up a theme of questioning. We do want to explore uh, the new help to claim contract that's been signed by Citizens Advice uh, with the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, and, and I won't hear a little bit more about, about what that involves, but I had um, raised concerns in, in Parliament last week that that new contract may signal a change in relationships between individual claimants and the DWP in as far as being able to pre protect their date of claim. And perhaps for clarity for witnesses and anyone watching, I should explain what that means. So uh, I'm sure Sandra McDermott from Glasgow will say a little bit more about that. But if someone was to walk into, say, a local authority, a library in Glasgow, and meet with a, a welfare officer wanting to make a, a claim for universal credit, if that claim cannot be submitted on the day they walk in for that support, their date of claim, their entitlement to claim benefit is protected from the day they walk in the door. Um, so my understanding is that was previously the situation for Glasgow. Um, but that is now not the situation as of April the 1st this year, which coincides or dovetails, if you like, with the new Citizens Advice Scotland contract with DWP. So I also understand that Citizens Advice Scotland also do not have the entitlement to exercise protected date of claim. There may, be, there may be ways around that, which you might hear about in a second, but they no longer have that entitlement. Indeed, my understanding is that the way monies were previously channelled from the DWP via local authorities, that ironically a citizen's advice worker could have the ability to have backdated dates of claim eh, for claimants because the money was channelled through local authorities who used to have this. Now, if people are still following, all that really means is that Glasgow have told me there could be up to 200 claimants each and every month who might lose out on monies because they no longer have protected date of claim status, but they're still running welfare advice and support services and a network of libraries across the city. So I think it's reasonable. I mean, I'm deeply concerned about this. I hope to be reassured today. I've had correspondence with the Chief Executive of Citizens Advice Scotland in relation to it, and uh, hopefully this can be fixed and fixed quickly to protect some of the most vulnerable people that that we all represent. So, uh, Sandra McDermott, can I maybe take you first just to yes, outline right. what you understand the situation to be? OK. Uh, thanks, Convener, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to provide evidence to committee today, which will hopefully maybe help clarify the position from Glasgow's perspective. And I look forward to seeing if there is uh, some development round about mitigation. And Glasgow did recognise uh, the risk to Glaswegians of the 
universal credit coming into Glasgow and as a result of that invested uh, £2 million. Pounds. And from that investment, we developed uh, 19 universal credit hubs across the city to make sure that the, the real challenges of claiming universal credit where it has to be claimed online, has to, you have to have the digital skills, the digital access to be able to do that. Then we developed that. And most of the hubs are in the libraries, but we also put in the Glasgow libraries across the city, but we also put in dedicated support for our really vulnerable groups, like rough sleepers, people that were homeless, people with a disability, uh, lone parents. So, uh, people from the Roma community and people with mental health problems that would find it access, uh, difficult maybe to access that support themselves, either to go into the library or to access the digital uh, skills or to provide their evidence. And previously, convener, as you'd mentioned, through the funding for local authorities, when we were previously funded to provide some support for universal credit, was through an arrangement from the Secretary of State, which gave us then the kind of con converted powers through the Secretary of State to protect the date of claim. And I suppose we were disappointed in the local authority to find out uh, quite late in the day, without any consultation, that that funding was stopping on the 31st of March. Uh, 2019 and that uh, Citizens Advice were going to be funded to do that service. Um, but because of the change of funding that is now a grant to uh, Citizens Advice to provide that, our understanding from colleagues in DWP is that we no there's no longer the ability either from the local authority because we're not fun no longer funded to provide that service uh, or to Citizens Advice to, pr to protect that date of claim. And to give you an idea of the numbers, since we put in the, the new universal credit hubs for full rollout in Glasgow, which was September 2019, um, the hubs, the universal credit hubs have supported just under 3,500 people. But those people have had to visit the library on numerous occasions to finish the verification of their claim and to, to make sure that their claim's complete to allow that money then to start to be paid out. So... You're talking about those people that have had to go for repeat appointments then because they can no longer protect their date of claim would have lost out on that money. And that's where the numbers that you're seeing cause us considerable concern of over 200 people that are going to lose out on that money constantly. And as the, the, the rollout grows, then more and more people are likely to be affected that. And again, it's likely to be our most uh, vulnerable citizens. And I suppose that the other key things that previously in the funding to local authorities the other thing that local authorities were funded for was personal budgeting services. So if you're giving people a universal credit payment as a one-off payment, uh, or sorry, as a, a full payment for all of those six benefits that are contained within universal credit, then it was uh, recognised that people needed budgeting skills, but budget, budgeting, personal budget and support isn't contained within the funding that Citizens Advice have received, and Ali will be able to give you some more detail about that. Um, there's also no uh, provision within the new funding to Citizens Vice for ongoing maintenance of the claim. It's for help to claim for the first six weeks to make your first claim to universal credit. But what you have to do in claiming universal credit to maintain that claim and to keep um, your claim in payment without the risk of sanctions, you have to then maintain a claimant commitment and a claimant journal online. So you have to constantly go in and update that journal to show DWP colleagues that you've been uh, adhering to your claimant commitment, whether that's looking for employment, uh, increasing your skills, whatever you have to do to maintain your claim. You also have to, your annual rent increase that has to be uploaded, has to be detailed in your, your claimant journal. If you don't have the ability to do that, then you can lose, you can lose out in much needed funding. And that particular element, those elements of it are no longer included in the funding that was given to Citizen Vice Scotland, where it was previously given to local authorities. So there is a real and genuine, genuine risk now and ongoing, as a, and I know migration has been slowed down slightly, but people are actually coming on to um, universal credit through natural change in circumstances, which again is a real risk, which I won't go into at the moment until it comes to questions, mm -hmm. because they don't get the tr transitional protections that they're afforded under uh, the actual planned migration. But convener, there is a real and, uh, risk to the most vulnerable citizens in Glasgow by the new model with, with the inability to protect the date of claim, as well as some of the other things that I'd mentioned. And I absolutely know that um, Citizen Advice will be concerned about that yes. as well seek to do oh, the best that they, they, they can to mitigate. Just for a little bit of clarity, the funding that Glasgow City Council has in place for the current financial year, that network of hubs, 
will be protected for the current financial year, even though DWP have terminated that relationship as of April the 1st. Is that correct? Yes, the £2 million was for uh, last financial year for 2017-18 and it was reinvested again this year. Um, there has been some reduction in funding to citizens advice uh, bureaus where it's, it was recognised that there was a duplication of funding because through any funding process or grant process you can't fund the same organisation to provide a similar or the same type of service. But the, the, the majority of the investment goes on those vulnerable groups that I'd mentioned and for the wider universal credit hubs. But there has been a slight reduction to some of the citizens advice bureaus who are now providing under help to claim because it was a similar service to the Glasgow City Council were providing. Okay, thanks. Ali, you understand the concern I would have. So I'm a Mary Hill Springburn MSP. Someone walks into the library in Mary Hill Road or at Springburn Shopping Centre or wherever in my constituency, they can meet a welfare rights advisor, they need to make a, a UC claim, they might not be able to submit it all uh, on that day. Uh, before the April the 1st, their date of claim was protected. They were getting that money back day to the day they walked in the door. Now that's, that's not the case. So that's a bad deal for my constituents. I suspect it may be the same in other, other local authorities. But Citizens Advice have got this help to claim contract with DWP now. So can you give any reassurances? Are you concerned about, about this situation? Can you give reassurances about how this can be mitigated or offset altogether? Does Citizens Advice have concerns about the fact that this, this contract doesn't include protected data claim? And with hindsight, maybe... Do you think that should have been a deal breaker for citizens' advice before they signed the contract in the first place? Okay. Well, firstly, thank you very much um, for inviting me along. Um, what I'd like to do is just put in context the protection of the date of claim and just overall um, what the Help to Claim service provides. Um, so, firstly, if I take your um, date of claim protection um, as one of the concerns that you've raised, um, so equally, um, when we had signed the contract, in the interim period where it was the implementation period between October and March. Um, at very early stages, we had communicated with the DWP about our position to be able to protect the date of claim. Um, we were advised by the DWP that under the um, legal definition of being considered as um, a person, a provider of services, that we could not um, be considered to be able to protect the date of claim. Um, that was obviously a significant um, concern for us and what we wanted to ensure was that people were not disadvantaged if they um, contacted the bureaus and they weren't able to protect the claim the same way that um, Sandra's explained in terms of the libraries. Um, so what did DWP um, agreed with us in terms of ensuring that there is mitigation in place and that nobody is disadvantaged um, were two things. One, that the DWP and the local job centre's role in terms of support that they are providing to um, citizens in terms of being able to submit their claim has not changed. And obviously, if somebody goes into a job centre, um, they are able to submit the date of claim. So in terms of a formal referral process that we did agree with the DWP, the DWP will only formally refer a claim to us for onward support um, until after the claim has been submitted. So the date of claim would be protected. Um, so apologies that you saw from my look there, I wanted to ask a question, but yes, I, didn't, I generally uh -huh. didn't want to interrupt you. Yep. Um, I, I mean, um, Mary Hill Job Centre has been closed in my community. Um, so yes, I understand date of claim is protected if you walk into a job centre, but a lot of people, and, and I would encourage them to walk into the job centres, absolutely genuinely build up that relationship. A lot of people get quite intimidated and nervous about walking into a job centre, they're much more likely to walk into a library or community support hub, and they do that. And they had a protection at that point, that protection is now, now gone. Um, so I, I'm not sure how, what you describe actually mitigates a situation. It's perhaps a workaround, but it's a workaround that existed before that protection was, was taken away. I don't know. So, so, please put more information on the record in relation to this, but I just, there was a disconnect between what you were saying there and what the reality would be on the ground. So, was there yeah. an, another question? No, could you give a little bit more information around um, how citizens' advice are seeking to mitigate the impact of the loss of protected date of claim? 
Okay, well, I think then if I start with just what the Citizens Advice Scotland has been um, contracted um, in terms of the grant agreement to provide in terms of help to claim. Um, so for the help to claim, um, we've got an expectation to be able to meet 20% of the anticipated universal credit claimants. Um, in terms of providing that support, um, all bureaus are providing face-to-face -face support and we also have multi-channel um, delivery. So the multi-channel delivery is through um, eight regional bureaus across the country. And in terms of participation within that, it's a total of 34 bureaus. Um, and that is allowing advisors to be able to provide advice by telephone and through web chat as well. So in terms of the, again, going back to the date of claim, so all advisors throughout the en engagement process, the it was clarified to them that we would not be in a position to protect the date of claim. Advisors obviously understand the um, position that unless the date of claim is protected, the individual will have an adverse impact. So they are seeing clients as soon as possible to ensure that there's no adverse impact to individuals. Where they may not be able to see the individual that day, they are able to refer the individual to either one of our multi-channel services and or still work with the local job centre to ensure that individual gets the support that they need that day and that there isn't an adverse impact on the date of claim. Okay, so is the able to get, I mean, it seems a bit of a workaround, so if someone walks into a, one of the 34 or 38 networks across the country, plus these, those multi-channel platforms that you mentioned, can Citizen Advice guarantee that the same day they will also be formally contacted to Department of Work and Pensions and Job Centre Plus and therefore have their date of claim protected that day? If the individual could not be seen to submit the claim themselves through the assistance of the Bureau, then they would contact the local job centre to ensure that they are seen and their date of claim is protected. So who would contact the job centre? The advisor in the Citizens Advice Bureaus. And have they got a direct hotline and is there a memorandum of understanding somewhere that says uh, as long as they seek to contact the job centre that day, protected date of claim will be uh, applied? Um, it's within the referral process and yes, there are um, contact numbers for um, job centres throughout the country that all the advisors have access to that the DWP have provided to us. And I, I know it's relatively uh, early days um, has there been any examples yet of a forum not? Because I think it's 20% was the figure Glasgow had, 20% of those who go to uh, Glasgow City Council support can't submit the forum at the first time. Quite often that can be citizens' advice workers who are giving that support. So that's a valid figure for citizens' advice. So for the 20% of people who have contacted citizens' advice since the 1st of April this year have those 20% of clients all had protected date of claim from their first contact with Citizens Advice? The date of claim um, would be from the date that the claim is submitted. So if an individual has contacted the Bureau, um, the Bureau would assist the individual to submit the claim. And in terms of early findings, I'm not aware of any clients who have contacted the Bureau and have not had the assistance to be able to submit the claim to have the adverse impact that you talk about. Yeah, I'm going to let my deputy convener in. in just two seconds, Pauline, I'm going to let my deputy convener in. I don't really want to pursue this much further simply because I know Citizens Advice want to help people. They want to get the claims in effectively and efficiently. But I am listening carefully to the words you're using around the protection is from the date of submission. But we know from Glasgow, 20% don't submit at the date they contact Citizens Advice or Glasgow City Council. So it looks to me as if that protection has been lost. And any information you can give to reassure us would be welcome. But I genuinely haven't heard anything that suggests that protection will endure via a workaround uh, somehow. Can I ask? I mean, maybe a question for Glasgow as well, but did Citizens Advice do any modelling work around this before they signed the contract? Because Glasgow clearly very quickly pulled together some statistics to see what the financial risk was to clients for losing protected date of claim, and that's 200 clients every month. Did Citizens Advice do any work in relation to that? Um, 
we've worked with the DWP in terms of ensuring that that situation doesn't arise and in terms of ongoing um, communication with the DWP, we are still discussing the matter of date of claim with them. I need to bounce into the really obvious question and I should put on record first of all that I have had correspondence with your Chief Executive Officer, uh, Derek Mitchell, in relation to this, who confirms that effectively my reading of it, and I'll make this publicly available this letter, that protected date of claim has been lost, but does then outline the various platforms by which you can get your protections, but not necessarily from the date you walk in the door uh, anywhere. He then goes on to talk about significant issues with universal credit that citizens' advice continues to have. So I'll, I'll, I'll maybe pass that letter to our clerks, make it publicly available on, 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 on our web page if, if, if that's an appropriate thing to do. But I suppose my final question would be for the Deputy Convener in to explore some of this further, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be supportive in asking these questions despite the deep concerns that I've got. Um, do you think the only fix that really stacks up here is that the Secretary of State and the DWP quite simply reinstate or find a legal way of instating protected date of claim from the date any constituent, any claimant walks in the door to either Citizens Advice, Glasgow City Council or any of the advice providers around this table? Is that not the quick fix? That would be our ask, yes. Yeah, that's really, really helpful. Thank you for putting that on the record, Deputy Convener. Yeah, it was really on that point, and yeah, I know it was quite a while ago that you mentioned it, but I just wanted to be clear. You said that it doesn't fulfil the legal definition. So prior to the contract, if the protected date of claim existed, I didn't fully understand why it doesn't now exist. Because has the legal definition changed? Or is it just applied differently? I believe it's being applied differently. So prior to you taking the contract then, so it's, so it's come about when you took the contract? After we took the contract, we were advised that we would not be in a position to protect the date of claim. Even though the law has not changed? It's just applying the law differently? That's what the DWP have advised us, that in terms of the grant that we've been awarded, um, we are not in a position to be able to protect the date of claim. Oh, it just seems pretty odd that you would prior to you taking up the contract, the protected date of claim existed. And then during the course of that, they've decided that the same law, we're going to apply it in a different way so that it's not protected. Would that be right? As far as I understand uh -huh. it, the DWP have advised us that um, when we ask... So they have, the well, they're, they're saying that they've wrongly applied the law this time then? <laughs> I'm not in a understand. position to comment on yeah. why they've advised yeah. us. Um, oh, that that's something we can take up. Thank um, you very much. That we can't predict the date of claim, but it was a question that we asked, um, and it was after the, con the grant award was given to us that we were advised that we wouldn't be able to protect the date of claim from when the client makes contact with us, and it is an issue that we will continue to proceed with them. So well, thank you very much for putting that on the record. I've got um, a couple of witnesses wanting to make some supplementary comments in relation to this discussion. I know Shona Robson, the MSP, wants, wants in to ask a question as well. Uh, I know it's taking a little bit of time on this, but I think by dereliction of duty on the Social Security Committee not to, to explore this and interrogate this when we've got the opportunity. So, so apologies, but we are taking a bit of time over this. I'll take more witnesses first and then I'll bring you in, Shona, if, if, if that's OK. Sandra McDermott. Okay, thanks, convener. It was just maybe in uh, relation to the question from the deputy convener. Uh, DWP have actually given us a written statement, which I can uh, provide to you. But what they're saying is uh, Regulation 10 of Universal Credit um, for the Regulations 2013 state that the date of the Universal Credit claim can be the first date of notification by the customer they need assistance to make claim, where the person's he helping them to make the claim is providing services to the Secretary of State. And I can give you a copy of this. And that's where the local authorities were previously funded through the Secretary of State. They go on to say, however, help to claim is delivered under a grant agreement with Citizens Advice and DWP's position is therefore that regular 10, Regulation 10 does not apply. So the impact of that on citizens is, is this is, as Citizens Advice are not providing services to the Secretary of State, the date of claim will remain the date the claim is fully submitted and not the date that help was requested. 
from citizens' advice. So they have to have the, their claim and all the evidence to support it. And that's where, for some of our really vulnerable customers, there's a delay, and that's where they're losing out on much needed money. I will listen to this. We'll think this has been a, a, a sleight of hand by the Secretary of State to, to, to erode rights of, of, of claimants. Um, but I'd just leave that there, Stephen McAvoy. I've had a look at this argument, and I actually think that the DWP's interpretation would be open to challenge. Um, so if the DWP were to refuse one of my clients um, the back date in a circumstance like this, I would be looking to challenge that to the first tier tribunal. Um, and if that was unsuccessful, we also have the upper tribunal as well, um, who can provide some clarity as to definitions and regulations. So can't guarantee that such a challenge would be successful. Um, but if one of my clients was refused a backdate under that regulation, I would certainly be looking to appeal against that. Okay, and the Secretary of State, we, I'm, I'm sure when our committee discusses this after this evidence session, we can make representations to the Secretary of State that this could be fixed quickly and as painlessly as possible if there's a, a political willingness to do it. But it's important we flush, that, flush it out at this, this evidence session. Uh, Shona Robinson? Yeah, um, I mean, it's very, very concerning. It sounds very much a contractual and funding um, mechanism, mechanism has been used to change what was done previously uh, and I definitely think we should pursue it. I'm curious to know what the situation is in the rest of Scotland. Obviously we have uh, Craig here from uh, Dundee um, and is it the, this is a national contract so presumably this has changed the situation for everybody. I'm assuming though there'll be a comparison to what went before and different areas will have had different supports prior to this change, which may mean that it varies in terms of what clients experienced before and what they experience now. But it would just be helpful to understand beyond Glasgow what the, the situation is with the, the, the date of claim. Not to pick on anyone in particular. No, no, that's <laughs> hold, that's okay. hold that thought, Craig, yep. <laughs> uh, because Kate had indicated she wanted to come in as well. So we'll take Kate and then we'll take Craig. Thank you. It's really just from an NHS perspective to say our concern is the impact on the most vulnerable people, people with mental health conditions, drug and alcohol problems, learning disabilities, who may really struggle to actually find their way to a CAB. And then when they get there, they may well then be referred onto a job centre um, and expected to get there within that same day. People cannot cope with, particularly vulnerable people, cannot cope in those sort of situations. We need to find a better way of doing this so that we actually have a welfare system and a social security system that enhances health and well-being and doesn't actually punish people who have ill health and disabilities. So it's just a, a point. That's very helpful. Uh, Shona Robson, MSP, rightly pointed out this is a Scotland-wide um, potential concern. Craig, what, what, what is the experience in Dundee? Um, I think Dundee is quite an unusual, it's in an unusual situation in that um, the large majority of the universal credit support to claim work was being done in one central point. So uh, we only have one job centre now um, in the Wellgate, which is coincidentally where the CAB are based and it's coincidentally where the main library service to help people to claim is based as well. So I suppose Dundee's taken a very joint partnership approach in the past, and that is well known now as the main central point with where to make a, a universal credit claim. Um, I know personally that um, CAB have probably tried to do a workaround um, within Dundee by actually co-locating within the job centre. So that will lead to significant speeding up of the claims process for anyone who accesses the face-to-face -face service of the CAB, but it still begs the question about those in outlying areas of Dundee who wish to make a claim on one day and unfortunately can't submit all their evidence. Okay. Any other comments in, in, from what... Yeah, from yes, a yeah. quick supplementary. I mean, if there's a 20% who don't submit the first time because of the complexities and the difficulties. I mean, you, you could envisage a situation it may be people who are further away from the, the, the well gate, but it could also be people who need more than one sit down to go through some of that. Um, so presumably, although the co-location is, is helpful, um, that's still going to affect their date of claim if because it won't necessarily be submitted on that first occasion. So presumably the same concerns. Yeah, but, yeah. it is. Okay. It's, it's, only, it's only a part mitigation and um, essentially you know, for the majority of clients making a claim for universal credit, 
chances are there will be something missing or something that they have to phone a relative or whatever to actually get access to in order to make the claim properly. Okay. Yes, Alia? I'm back on that in relation to the co-location. Um, if they're co-located and providing advice within a job centre, then obviously they would be able to get assistance from the job centre staff who would be in a position to protect the date of claim. Yeah. Right. So even if they were... Um, even if they had all those complexes and didn't have all the information, the date of claim would be triggered <coughs> because of the, the job centre location in that situation. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Under the Secretary of State, so the advisor yeah, okay. in the yeah. job centre yeah. has that power. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that was my understanding as well yeah. earlier that if, if you walk in because I mean I, I visited Springburn job centre a few months ago this is not about demonising job centres the DWDD or the DWP so we're trying to work effectively in partnership with them and this feels like an erosion of service but Springburn job centre was very clear if you walk in there the date you walk in that door and ask for help to submit a claim you get that protection the issue for my community is that there was lots of points and areas and supports in my community where you could get that automatic instant support and guarantee that now no longer exists. So from my view, it's an erosion and a diminution of service, but we should be pretty clear for anyone listening to this. If you walk into your job centre, you'll get your protected data claim. I think it's really important you put that, put that on the record. Yeah. Yes? I, I was just going to say, um, if there's no more questions on the date of claim, what I would like to do is just... Um, give an overview of what the help to claim service is. And then we could open it out to further questions and discussion, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, as I said before, the um, bureaus across the country are providing help to claim face-to-face. Um, -face. So that's in all of the local authorities. We've got 59 bureaus across the country. Um, they're providing advice not only through their uh, main offices, but outreaches as well. So we've got 95 um, different locations from which help to claim is being delivered um, in areas where there are um, a local CAB doesn't exist. Um, it is the neighbouring citizens advice bureaus that are covering those areas. Um, in a number of local authorities, there is um, co-location, as Craig had mentioned. Um, in addition to that, we've got <coughs> different routes that people can contact us now. So to support the face-to-face, -face, we've also got telephony as well as web chat. Um, and people obviously are able to um, get self-help through the public advice site, which has fairly comprehensive information. Um, what we have done is to ensure that all bureaus have the technological infrastructure to allow them to support individuals. Um, so they all have been um, given access to, they've been given computers, um, tablets. We've got public access Wi-Fi. So if individuals are just needing digital access that that is um, available to them as well um, and obviously with the telephony and web chat they have the infrastructure for that um, as i said we are expected to meet 20 percent of the anticipated volumes and what what we did in terms of working to look at what was the best way to deliver this um, is as sandra had mentioned that this is about submitting the claim up to some, a person receiving their full final payment for the first claim that they've submitted. Um, now, the reason that we chose to focus on that was to take a proactive approach of getting people at the early stage of submitting a claim so that we could get them to be in a position where they wouldn't have any difficulties thereafter. Um, in terms of the stages of um, being able to access support, um, the different routes that they have in terms of the multi-channel and face-to-face, -face, our approach is that there is no wrong door that people can access the service from. Um, we are working very closely with local partnerships. Um, in addition to the DWP, bureaus have fairly strong rooted partnerships within their local authority areas, um, within the community, so both within statutory and community services. Um, at the first point, the individual's um, needs would be assessed to ensure that not only was the universal credit the right claim for them to be submitting, but um, what particular channel choice they would like to get advice on. Um, thereafter, it's helping them to submit the claim and then um, up until the first payment. So it's about 
opening email accounts, um, helping them with opening a bank account, creating universal credit, um, filling in the application form, and where there are particularly vulnerable clients. There is no change to what the DWP and local job centres obligations are, so where we find that the individual needs a home visit um, and or a telephone claim might be more appropriate for them, we would be arranging that for them. Um, the issue of the time sensitivity of ensuring that claim has been submitted has been discussed in a fair bit of detail, but just to re-emphasise that advisors are fairly clear that the individual needs to have their claim submitted um, so that their, um, the process of their claim can start and the date of claim is protected. Um, there after, um, in terms of, Sandra had also talked about the personal budgeting support. That is not an aspect that is covered within um, the scope of the service. However, um, individuals are um, taken through what their payment will be, um, the frequency of that payment, um, how to manage their payments, um, what they can do if they are in any financial hardship. So being able to apply for um, alternative payment arrangements, being aware of the Scottish choices, um, if they need an advance payment and or um, referral for any other financial support. Um, they would also be supported in terms of the evidence that they need and be ready to go and attend the appointment that they have with the work coach um, and in terms of the verification of the identity. So trying to take as many proactive steps that you can to ensure that once the person is um, attended their appointment, then the process in terms of them being able to get their payment on time is as smooth as possible. Um, they're also prepared in terms of ensuring, so we talked about maintaining the journal and um, the commitments that they have to do, so really taking them fairly thoroughly what they need to do in terms of maintaining that journal and where it's identified that they will have support needs ensuring that they are informing their work coaches of that so that the commitments are manageable. Um, and finally, we would support them with any other support needs that they have, either through referral to um, the services that the bureaus might provide themselves and or I'd mentioned that they're fairly well integrated within their communities, so they've got very good partnership relationships with any other services, so they would be referred um, onwards on with existing partnerships should that have been necessary. Okay. Um, so that's an overview of what the um, Help to Claim service provides. Um, in terms of sort of very early indication of um, volumes and numbers, um, we're seeing that consistently increase week by week. Um, and we're also seeing that there is, the channel choice is being used. So. 57% um, of the clients are coming to us via face-to-face, -face, um, but we've got 40% of clients that are accessing the service through um, telephone and web chat combined. Um, the, in addition to the entitlement, the main um, issues that are coming up as expected is um, the claiming process, um, support with digital access and online, and advance payments. In terms of the different um, access points, so we have seen that a lot of people do need assistance with digital access and assistance, and um, understandably, those that need face-to-face -face appointments, that's where you would see the highest number of um, assistance in that area, whereas people that are calling on the helpline and or using the web chat are not needing that as much. Um, the largest area of support is in relation to submitting a claim. Um, followed by support to the first payment. Um, we are seeing a lot of quick questions as well, and quick questions through the telephony and web chat, um, which again is understandable. Those quick questions are um, anything that somebody might need that they're submitting the claim themselves and are able to do so, but are just looking for a little bit of reassurance that they're on the right path. I think I've given you quite a lot of time to kind of flesh out what that looks like. I thought it was important because the open line of questioning was kind of probing a little bit in relation to what could be an erosion of service. And I'm keen just to open it out and maybe other witnesses could think about whether they think this helped to claim contact. I'll take you for a supplementary, Jeremy, before, but what like maybe other witnesses to think in their head about whether they think help to claim is filling a gap that 
didn't previously exist? Does it duplicate other services? Does it complement other services? Are you coordinating around that? What what are the relationships like? Is one of the other questions we've got is how this all fits together in a kind of network of support across the country and where the gaps might 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 still exist. But can I just check very quickly? Um, in terms of the the help to submit a form, what is the average time for someone who doesn't submit their form on the day they seek support from citizens' advice? Do you have that? I'm um, sorry, ask that again, please. So, if not everyone will submit their forum on the day that they seek to claim. So, what is the average time it takes those who don't submit on the same day? Do you have that information? Is it one week? Is it two weeks? I know it's only six or seven weeks this has been going. Mm -hmm. Have you got any emerging data on that? Or could you provide data at a later date on that, perhaps? Um, I don't have any data on that at the moment. Um, what we do have um, is ongoing support contact with our bureaus in terms of asking whether there are any issues in terms of submitting a claim and there isn't anything that's been reported back to us as so um, i think that that, that that is a statistic would be quite helpful yeah. numbers so as of the last full week of this service what was the weekly numbers of people using the service um so in the first week of um accessing um the help to claim it was 249 and um in last week it was nearly 400, so it was 387. That's really helpful. Thank you. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Convener, and, and welcome to everybody. I suppose I'd just like to maybe broaden it out slightly, if that's okay, Convener. Um, uh, and that is around the whole issue of, um, I suppose, the Convener's already, in the cluttered environment we have with lots of different benefits, and some of it being funded through DWP, some of it being funded through Scottish Government, some of it being funded through local authorities. Um, and one of the things that, as the bill was going through um, a couple of years ago, the Cabinet Secretary made clear, is that Scottish Government only wanted to fund the benefits that we were responsible for, not for the other benefits. But clearly, for my visit to the West Lothian CAB, when somebody phones up and says, I want to make a universal claim, the CAB person will also take them through all the other benefits they might be entitled to as well, which is absolutely what should be happening. But I just, I, what I'm going forward, I suppose it's looking forward slightly to the next few years as more benefits will be delivered here in Scotland. How, how do you work and how do you work out how much money we get from DWP to do this work and how much we get from Scottish Government to do this work? Can you do that? Or would it be better for the two governments to come together and just joint fund the organisations to provide a holistic service? Because what I'm concerned about is how do you get your funding to do PIP compared to, say, universal credit, if that makes sense? Yes, Stephen? Yeah. I think it would be very difficult to advise in some kind of vacuum where we're only funded to do this work and we're only funded to do this work. Um, to give somebody proper and full advice, you need to be assessing the full picture um, of the person's circumstances, particularly with universal credit. There was a gateway introduced in January um, for people who have entitlement to the severe disability premium. And if those people are misadvised because somebody's maybe failed to take into account the full picture, the long-term cost implication to that person can be quite significant. For advice agencies, I don't really if it matters so much where we get the money as, as long as we get it, um, and that there's no restriction on that money that impacts on our ability to be an impartial service. Um, I think that the main thing for us would be that the money's available and that it's not so specific that it has to be we can only deal with this and we can only deal with this, because I think that would just significantly increase the chance of poor advice. Um, and also reduce the chances that decisions would be challenged. Um, because it's not just a practical day to day. We've been discussing this regulation um, as to when a claim for universal credit might be accepted. And my opinion is that the DWP's definition might well be open to challenge. Um, and it's important that we've got advice agencies that are able to do that kind of work. Um, the challenging that might help people in longer term, as well as the day to day helping people to make claims. I, mean, I, absolutely agree. I think that's really helpful. I suppose my concern is that the money that you do need to work falls between two, between two stools and either Scottish government say, well, that's UK's responsibility or the UK government says. And, and I just wondered, have you done any thinking around a more holistic approach with two governments trying to work together to fund organisations like yourself? Or is that just a pipe dream? Again, I, I think it's, it's difficult for us really to answer because the main thing for us is that we get the funding. 
and it doesn't impact in any way on our ability to provide an impartial service. Once we've got that funding, I'm fairly confident that we know how to deliver th that service. Um, so I, I don't know from your point of view if it really matters where the funding would come from. I suppose that's an issue for the two governments. I wonder if maybe Karen Craddock from Improvement Service might want to add something to this. I'll take it in a second, Alison. I think it's important to recognise too that local authorities are one of the key funders of advice services as well as Scottish and UK governments. Um, advice is diff delivered in different ways at a local level. So what happens in Dundee is very different from what happens in Glasgow or what happens in Clapped Manorshire. And that really is how it should be. Um, local areas are best placed to determine the needs and priorities of local people. What would work more effectively is there were, if there was a more joined up approach and how support for advice services was looked at in a much more in a much wider basis. I think what has this has demonstrated is that there is a danger if you look at one element of, of advice and you look at it in a national level that that local context and that ability to deal with things using local partnership and local arrangements is lost. So I suppose what we would advocate is that we take a more holistic view of advice services, we look at what works, um, and we align the funding to deliver services that best meet local needs in a way that local service users want and can take advantage of. Craig, do you want to come in? There, there has been an argument for years um, that um, advice provision should be um, put on a, st a statutory footing. Um, you know, if you look at the, the, the powers which um, ask for advice to be delivered by local authorities, um, it's a varied field, um, different legislative sources for different specific purposes. Um, I would probably say that I would agree with Stephen and also Karen. I think you have to have, um, I, you have, to have the full picture. Um, you can't deal with one benefit in isolation of another. Um, there needs to be some sort of at least quality assurance that the advisor that you're speaking to knows what they're talking about and they're considering all your options at the same time. Um, and that's part and parcel of the reason for Scottish National Standards for Information and Advice, which when it came along initially, I welcomed fully because it gave you that quality assurance model that had been sorely lacking in previous years. Um, and I think that, you know, the, that is the benchmark that I think you know, agencies should be looking to as a matter of course. Um, it's a necessity in this day and age, given the complexity of the benefit system. Um, so we receive the vast majority of our funding, obviously, as a local authority advice service from our local authority. But that is um, based on the, the, you know, the budgets um, tightening um, and the level of that funding. Um, certainly in the last few years has reduced, um, you know, and I think that's the picture generally across the board in Scotland. And that is a worry. And I think the statutory footing might help in that regard. Um, okay, Sandra McDermott. Okay, thanks very much. I think that's a really in interesting question. And um, I've got some thoughts round about it, but Glasgow City Council, we invest from our own core budget. Um, through our settlement from uh, Scottish Government, £3.4 million pounds in financial inclusion services, which helps fund citizens' vice bureaus, but also some other nine independent uh, law centres in financial inclusion and money advice uh, services. And in the last four years, that service has supported over 106 thousand people and brought in £140 million pounds of additional financial gains, as well as managing £104 million pounds of debt. And as I'd mentioned, we've also increased that amount of funding by £2 million pounds a year to help with the mitigation of universal credit. And I think everybody around the table would probably agree that UK uh, benefits and welfare reform changes has made a significant increase in the, the amount of demand for welfare support and welfare rights services. And Sheffield Hallam University has just done a, a recent report on Glasgow. I know they've done one previously, convener, but they've just uh, published a recent report to say from 2010 up until 20, uh, 2020, by 2020, the Glasgow economy will have lost over £300 million pounds as a result of welfare reform changes. We also have an in-house welfare uh, rights service, a bit like Dundee, again, uh, that Richard Gass, which some of you might know, uh, manages. And again, that's another investment of £2 million. Pounds. I myself run a welfare benefit service for people with cancer and other long-term conditions to make sure as a result of their health condition, 
their inability to work, their inability maybe to have more heating because they're housebound or whatever, or travel expenses, that they are not even more disadvantaged as a result of their cancer and other long-term conditions. But I think you're absolutely right. I think it's about partnership working. Uh, that really makes it work. So whether it's with our colleagues in health, whether it's its in vice bureau, whether it's in-house local authority or other third sector or charitable organisations, it's about making sure that you've got the whole picture. As Craig said, that, that you're you're looking at through the lenses, putting the person and their family at the centre. What do they need the most, and what's that support structure either within the local authority or within the other networks that can allow it to uh, for a more seamless, holistic service, as you had mentioned. Uh, to happen, and we've got a really good example of that through the universal credit money. We've invested some funding into Glasgow Disability Alliance in Glasgow, and in the last six months, the universal credit went live. I think uh, you'd mentioned, Stephen, about the transitional protection. So there's a real risk with universal credit. You use your you can lose your disability uh, transitional protection, your severe disability premium uh, by moving on to that. So we've put in a, a additional support, welfare rights support, into Glasgow Disability Alliance, who are working from the Alliance. And they're going out and engaging with disability uh, people and people with disabilities and families with a child or an adult with disabilities. And they've supported hundreds of people claim half a million pounds in benefits and protection of those benefits just in the last few months that they didn't know they were entitled to. But it's a really strong partnership as well, which has been a really good example. Um, obviously, we're working really closely with Scottish Social Security in Glasgow that are just along the road from us, uh, the Chambers and High Street, to make sure that when the new benefits are released, and a really good example of that is the Best Start Grant, about automating that with the Registrar of Scotland. So when you, you've got to register your baby within 21 days, is saying uh, if you go in to register the baby, you want any of these qualifying benefits. The customer adv uh, service advisor then fills in your application for Best Start Grant, and by the time you leave, after registering the baby's birth, the money's on your way to the bank account. And obviously, previous examples that I'd mentioned to the deputy convener about how we've automated in Glasgow the school clothing grant. And I suppose what I'd like the committee maybe to uh, consider is maybe helping us as a local authority. We've got real aspirations about having a single financial assessment. Um, and I'm not the best at IT, uh, but I've got this vision that if you take a, a person or a family that claim for benefits through the local authority or through one of our partner organisations, that there's some kind of algorithm that takes account of all the family circumstances, whether it's the family composition, household composition, your financial circumstances, your disability, your health, and then something works out in the background. This is what you're entitled to. And we actually give people what they're entitled to instead of having to jump through a number of hoops to get what they're entitled to. And I think for Scotland and the new powers, the devolved powers, that would be a huge leap forward and it would link to the new duty of uh, on uh, elected members and ministers to be able to um, promote the, the uptake of benefits. And if we could do that through something really innovative, like a single financial assessment, uh, I think that would be a fantastic step forward. But I think it was a really good question. Thank you. I see lots of nodding heads from our, our witnesses when you said that. So we will take you up on that offer about how we can work with you as a committee and maybe discuss that at, at another time. I know other MSPs want, and I'll wait to the witnesses have indicated they want, they want to speak some more, and then to MSPs in for more questions. Kate Burton to be followed by Craig. Thank you. Um, just really picking up on Sandra's point about partnership working, I think within the NHS we have got welfare rights advisors embedded or integrated into GP practice and early years services and that works incredibly well to meet the needs of people with mental health conditions, um, drug and alcohol problems, lone parents etc. But what's absolutely crucial is that those welfare advisors can see the whole person and work with all the work and support that person with all the benefits they're entitled to. So picking up on the question, I do have concerns if um, with the new agency, if those advisors are only able to support people with a few benefits, but not able to see the whole person and be able to support them with all benefits that people are entitled to. I also think there's a real strength in integrating with health services as Sandra's um, example of the improving cancer journey explains, if you have a, a welfare rights advisor in a GP practice there is, or uh, with the maternity services, there's no stigma for those people in going along to the practice to see an advisor. They haven't got to go through a door which has above it 
have you got money worries, you know, which your neighbours might see you going into. Um, it also means that people are familiar with the appointment system in a GP practice because you make the appointment just as we would make the appointment if we were going to see a practice nurse. The patient seeing the advisors in the practice make the appointment with the receptionist. They wait to see the advisor in the GP or um, midwifery service cons um, waiting room. It's all very familiar to people, so it's about removing barriers to access, and that's absolutely crucial when we look at these new and emerging partnerships as we go forward to deliver social security in Scotland. But it is crucial, I think, that we don't have some advisors focused on one aspect of benefits, other advisors focused on some. That's too confusing for the individual. It's confusing for me. And, um, you know, I, I'm at the moment, don't have a mental health problem or a drug and alcohol problem. What it's like for people in those situations trying to navigate um, benefits it must be horrific. Craig Mason. Yeah, uh, just to echo some of Sandra's points about a universal um, assessment, I came from a voluntary sector organisation in the late 90s and um, came to Dundee City Council at a time when they had, it was three years into the introduction of charging for non-residential care. Um, but as part of the process of um, working out the individual charge of a, a household uh, for the social work services they were getting, there was a systematic approach to both um, looking at the income of the individual, maximising that income to best effect. And I was blown away by it at the time. And I think this is, this is part of what Sandra is suggesting, but on a much larger scale. Um, and certainly, you know, making it simple, go to people before um, they actually have to apply for a particular benefit or an entitlement. The, I mean, this, is, this has been happening in small pockets for years. West Lothian showed us an example where they interrogated housing benefit data um, in 2003, I think it was, um, to offset some of the, the pain of having a rent increase. But as a result of that, the financial gains for the individuals who had their, their data interrogated was much, you know, it was much increased income for all the households um, that had a, a separate entitlement. Um, so this idea has been going on for years and I think it's a great opportunity to potentially hardwire it into a lot of the systems and the key to that is partnership working. Thank you. I'm going to take Karen Carrick next and uh, several bits from MSPs. Alison Johnson is next on my list to come in uh, in relation to this line of questions. So, so, sorry, just now, Shona. Uh, Karen Carrick. I mean, some of the customer journey research we've done has evidence that people are more likely to use digital means of accessing advice services and web chat is proving increasingly popular. Inverclyde Council are actually looking at providing or providing web chat services to uh, advice service customers. But what they're also doing is looking at establishing a benefits checker like Entitled To on their website. And there has been quite a lot of discussion with other local authorities but about having the same kind of, of benefits checker on their website. So there would be local websites, but they would all have the same process used and the same methodology. And I think that would link quite well. It's maybe the starting point for taking up um, what Sandra's suggesting, because there is a rudimentary partnership there that's working at looking at offering this kind of uh, support. Now, sorry to my MSPs. I'm trying after I probably took too much, too, too much time to start, so I apologise for that. But apologies to MSPs. I'm trying to give preference to it. See Stephen McAvoy and then definitely Alison Johnson next after that. Stephen. Um, Digital has got a, a lot of benefits for people accessing advice, but I think we need to also be careful that that can't be seen to be replacing good face-to-face -face advice. Um, just as an example of that, I had a client in December um, who, based on her particular circumstances, if she had made a claim at that point, she would have lost entitlement to the severe disability premium going forward. So I actually advised her future proof that in January this change was probably going to happen and that if she held off and had a short-term loss, that in the longer term, if she made her claim after the gateway was applied, that she would actually be far better off in the longer term. And there just isn't a digital system that you're ever likely to create that will be able to give you that bespoke advice. So I think it's good. It can obviously kind of have a wide reach. Um, and there might be people who would use it and benefit that might never access a face-to-face -face service. But 
um, we need to be careful that we still have a really, really good provision of face-to-face -face advice by experienced people who can give you that um, full picture. And just also, Craig mentioned um, putting advice on a statutory footing. The social security legislation in Scotland sort of does that because the right to advocacy mentioned in there. Um, but I think we're still really to fully define what we mean by ag advocacy. Um, because to my mind, there can be a big difference between advocacy and the type of advice that a welfare rights service would provide. That's helpful. And I will take you in earlier, but uh, Alison has been very patient. So to Alison just now, then we'll take you back in at a later date. Yeah, um, thank you, convener. Um, I'm really pleased we're having this discussion this morning because we know how many, you, you, you know, the amount of entitlement that people do not benefit from is, is quite overwhelming. It's staggering. So we clearly need to make sure that people have got access to, you know, as Craig Mason has made the point, high quality uh, welfare rights advice. I mean, I find this in, an incredibly complex area. So you are talking about a lot of training and a lot of expertise. Um, so I really appreciate that we're getting the benefit from you this morning. Um, in the, um, the submission from the Improvement Service, there's, uh, you know, you're noting that, you know, this, this, this kind of service is so effective, but investment in it is reducing. Um, local authority investment is mentioned um, at a time when demand is increasing. And I, I know, you know, we have this kind of a statutory approach, but it seems to me that we do need to do more. And, you know, um, Kate Burton was speaking about the value of embedding this kind of advice in a stigma-free environment. I think that's really key too. Um, and apparently a social return on investment estimate of co-location of advice workers in NHS primary care settings suggests that every one pound invested um, has a benefit of £39 when it comes to social and economic benefits. So I, I just kind of like to understand, we know how much good can result from, from access to good advice, but what can we do to, you know, how can we help better convince local and national government that this is something we need to invest more in? Because, you know, if people aren't getting access to cash, we're all going to we're all, you know, the costs are there in the long term and, and with regard to poor health and other outcomes. What can we do to make sure that local and national government understand this is an area that needs greater investment? I'm just wondering, because you, you name-checked the Improvement Service submission, that, that's a really good excuse to bring Karen Carrick in. Um, so, Karen, what, what's your perspective on those, those important comments from Alison? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, obviously, um, the resources available to local government are shrinking. Um, but budget cuts don't impact on services equally. Protected services su suffer significantly less in terms of reduction in funding than unprotected services. So education cuts are minimal, but in relation to advice services, which isn't a protected service because it doesn't have that kind of statutory footing, the cuts are, are much, much greater and are much deeper. It would be nice to think that there would be increased investment in advice services, but realistically, given the current position across all government, that's unlikely to happen. So I think what local councils are doing are thinking about, well, we're unlikely to be able to increase resources in this vital service, so is there a way that we can deliver it differently? Um, and that's the approach that, that many are taking. So what they're looking at is providing face-to-face -face services which are essential but making sure that it's people that who most need face-to-face -face services, who are most vulnerable, that are able to access them in a way that's free from stigma and in a way that meets their needs through schools, through health centres, uh, through libraries, looking at taking services out to people. But at the same time as they're, they're doing that, they are aware of the fact that the digital offer is much more cost effective in the long run. And there are people who can access services digitally. So if you make that easier and you make that available, then that is a way of saving some resources that can be used to target the face-to-face -face services that are most valuable. Thinking of you know, Sandra McDermott's comments, and I know in a... I feel like I've been on this committee now for, for some time, but I know um, the deputy convener and I were very interested in that idea of a universal assessment, apply once, access everything. And if you have got that sort of one-stop shop approach, then you would imagine that we can use the welfare rights expertise that we have more efficiently instead of someone having to, you know, 
just make lots of individual applications. I mean, that, that would surely be a really cost-effective approach. Um, so, you know, I'm just wondering why are we, why have we not made any progress on that as yet? And, and who's, I suppose, who's responsible would it be to push that, that pro we progress forward? We certainly have had discussions in this committee on this several times now. And the committee was, was given a Scottish Government report published 2018, research done in 2016 in relation to uh, publicly funded advice services. And one of the elements of that said the literature indicates the need for intelligent, strategic and longer term funding decisions to, take, to be taken in relation to advice provision. Emphasis placed on the need for greater evidence-based and outcomes-focused funding decisions has been taken and for more join, joining up in relation to funding decisions across public sectors to ensure quality and to avoid duplication. So there's the Scottish Government publishing something in 2018 from research in 2016 that sees, and, and that publication talks about growing demand and shrinking funds for, for advice provision as well. So, so there's one tier of government. You've got the UK, you've got the Scottish, you've got local authorities, and you've got the third and independent sector as well. And there's, there's a call from the a Scottish Government research saying we need to do this in a much more coordinated fashion. Who's got, I think Alison's point absolutely hits the nail on the head, Whose responsibility is it to drive this? Joint responsibility can mean no individual or nobody takes the absolute responsibility. So we would, I think we would really appreciate a steer as a committee. Well, you will actually, I, I think it's, I think it's this committee's job actually to really continue the work that we started at Alison mentioned. Um, can I begin by saying, Sandra, um, I, you know that I think that the work that Glasgow and other local authorities have done in automated benefits is absolutely cutting edge. And uh, I know it's not the only local authority, um, but it's one I'm familiar with. And I, I know that this is the way forward. And um, so Alison Johnson and I go way back to where Jean Freeman had actually sat in on a session with us. And I know that Shalan Somerville has certainly, in answer to us, committed to the same principle. So it seems to me, I think we need to keep this going. Can I just make mention of a letter we received from Inverclyde Council, who um, said that they are concerned that they no longer go forward on their plans for automated benefits because of data protection. Uh, how many times have I heard this in terms of the barriers that the Data Protection Act has caused for some of the good work? Um, have you looked at this, I wondered, and do you think there's any way around this? And perhaps um, maybe you could give a view as to whether or not you think this committee could do more work um, ongoing to kind of try and push forward on other ways to automate benefits. I think when we, I come along to speak to committee, I think we recognised, and I think uh, Jean Freeman at that point had asked the question about when it does move on to universal credit and you've no longer got the housing benefit data to automate the school clothing grant, because as you'll remember that we were matching uh, the data within housing benefit council tax to demonstrate the family composition and the eligibility criteria for school clothing grant and matching up the school records and CMIS, matching them together and giving that payment out automatically. Uh, to people after demonstrating their entitlement without the need to fill in a forum that was actually unnecessary or deemed unnecessary by the working group. Um, since then, and I think uh, convener uh, Richard Gass from Glasgow City Council has written to you on the matter, what we've done is looked at that again, because obviously housing benefit are now made up of one of the six benefits that make up universal credit. So in longer term, uh, we won't have access to the housing benefit data because it will be assumed into universal credit data that we're using council tax uh, reduction data. And because council tax and uh, the administration of council tax is actually part of the local authority and it's not deemed to be one of the benefits, then we've had uh, the authority to continue to use that benefit. And it's detailed in the letter to yourself, convener, uh, with the confidence that we're we're confident within Glasgow that we can continue to use that process using council tax data. I think that's very helpful information. I should say for the public record, it, it will be circulated to, 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 to members, but Alec Sharma, has the, the UK minister uh, with responsibility in this area, has written back to our committee, to myself, saying they are going to enter into discussions with Inverclyde Council to see if they can identify how to remove those barriers. Now, um, that at least shows a willingness across 
every tier of, of, of government. So, uh, absolutely, why, why do that once with one local authority? It's about a thousand conversations, but it's coordinating and structuring and making sure when you get that win, it's replicated across the country. And I think we'd be keen to work with, with you to see how we can, we can do that. Before I bring more MSPs in, any more comments in this area? There being no more comments other than MSPs putting hands up, and in the order on my list, I promise you, eh, Shona, Keith Brown was next on my list. Keith. Uh, just a couple of points, uh, and it's really, I think, for the improvement service. Um, first of all, to say, I think it's useful to bear in mind that we hear an awful lot on this committee from Glasgow and Edinburgh as the biggest councils, but there are areas like in my area in Clipmanage, which has worse child poverty stats than. Glasgow does not have the resources that a big council has to address some of these issues. And my concern is about the lack of benefit take-up in areas like that. As well. I think south of Scotland and also Western Isles will be similar. South of Scotland with uh, wage levels being lower than the rest of the country. It's just about the, the part that said in your report there were, just for local authorities, 85 external and 32 internal money and welfare rights advice services receiving funding from local authorities. There's the money that goes from the Scottish Government to um, citizens' advice, money goes from the UK government. And although I agree it would be great if everybody that's providing services can provide advice on all the different benefits, I'm not sure it's realistic to do that. And I just wonder whether um, some more kind of efficiency being put through the system. I mean, the reason why the report was commissioned in December, I commissioned the report, was because of the new advice powers that the Scottish government was taking on in consumer advice areas which is actually a complete dog's breakfast when you look at the breakup of the Smith Commission. So the Scottish Government's got the right to give advice, but not to take any enforcement action. So given how complex it is, and some of these things come from different areas, what we're trying to do is protect the people that are most in need of this to get the right service. And as has been said already, to maximise the benefit take up, because both in generic terms, if you can get the hundreds of millions, even billions of pounds, which are not claimed, that's going to benefit the entire economy, but more particularly benefit individuals as well. Is there a view on what the best way, is it simply keep providing more money to the, what's already there, or look afresh at how you actually provide these advice services? There's lots of vested interest in this area. How do you get beyond that to make sure that the person that needs it most gets the, the maximum take up of benefit? I'm Carrick first, though, to Ali after that. Yeah. I mean, what we would say is that it's best left to local partnerships, ideally community planning partnerships, which involve all sectors to think about how best advice services can be provided in their area. Um, and that's the sort of the approach we would take, because, as I've said, what local needs are, are very different in different communities. So the danger of imposing something on a national basis is that those local needs are not fully recognised and met or delivered in a way that best suits local situations. So I suppose what we would suggest is that there should be a, a more coordinated approach between all the funders, all the public sector funders of advice services, whether it's setting up some sort of strategy at a national level that gives flexibility and creativity for, be, for being implemented at a local level, so it gives the principles, if you like, of a framework which people can operate, but it is important that the key partners have shared objectives, are seeking to deliver the same outcomes, but most importantly, have agreed how they will work together to deliver it. Because unfortunately, at the moment, that's not, not happening. And the quality of advice that people can access is very variable in different areas too. So that's a factor that, that has to be considered. What we are suggesting is that there's really a review of how advice services are delivered, that there's a recognition that there is it should be an improved digital offer, but also that at a local level, that face-to-face -face is delivered through diverse providers, uh, diverse channels, and in different locations and different using different models. Yeah. Ali, do you want to add to that? Um, I had a few points to add following on from um, Jeremy's initial um, comment, which was about um, a holistic service and joining up some of the benefits um, advice, but so we, um, Craig had mentioned the Scottish National Standards, and the Scottish National Standards bring together money, housing, and welfare rights, recognising that quite often these matters are interlinked and one has an impact on the other. And our own 
research shows that when somebody comes in to get advice, um, there are other associated issues. So if we take help to claim um, on its own, our initial findings are that there are four other advice issues that people are coming to get advice on um, that they're able to um, get from within the holistic service that bureaus deliver. But um, some of the other points that have been mentioned that I just wanted to tie in in terms of that, how do we work more in collaboration? How do we make sure that it is customer focused and recognizing that um, when an individual is seeking advice, regardless of the reason and the um, circumstances, they are going to be vulnerable at one point or the other. That, that's the reason why they're seeking advice. Um, their resilience in terms of being able to deal with that is um, impacted by other associated factors. But some of the things that have been mentioned, so um, Kate had mentioned about sort of health settings and um, advice being provided within health settings. It's not only just sort of the comfort, but it's also, for example, in relation to disability benefits, where you're providing advice within the health context, you've got a better opportunity to be able to get the evidence. And we talked about sort of, you know, who, whose responsibility is it in terms of um, the, the funding to the advice sector, but also I think there needs to be a recognition of cost savings um, in terms of being able to get the advice at the early stage as to what it might cost public services um, in terms of not only mental health, but, you know, housing and homelessness. Um, Stephen had mentioned about advocacy support and one of the bureaus has done sort of a pilot about advocacy support and welfare benefits and where advocacy support is available. What's the outcome in terms of um, the decision of the relevant benefits. So we know, for example, there's 68% of um, refusals that in terms of appeals. And what they looked at was if advocacy support was available, what, how did that impact in terms of the outcome? And the, you know, the initial results, albeit trialed in very small cases, um, are very encouraging. So for example, um, in ESA cases, in 47 cases where advocacy support was provided, there was only 11% that resulted in refusals. If you take that cost benefit against if that went to appeal and how much that costs in terms of processing the appeal, there's, in terms of the collaboration, there's also cost savings that can be done by the early intervention. Um, and I think some of the points that have been made by colleagues, there's definitely a need to bring that um, consolidation into place. The last point I just wanted to make was in relation to channel um, and to digital. And I think it's recognising a channel choice as opposed to a channel shift. Um, so there are definitely people who are more likely to, for example, there's an increase in web chat, um, telephony, but that's not to diminish the importance of face-to-face. -face. Um, and what we will be doing, particularly in relation to the help to claim, is just looking at that customer journey of sort of that channel choice of how many people actually start with face-to-face -face and end up using perhaps multi-channel um, um, resources in terms of web chat and telephone and or vice versa as well. So I think it's looking at analysis. Okay. Can I just say, it was, web chat concerns me because I've used web chat for, it's, it, it could, you could lose the world to live. How slow it is. That's been my experience of web chat. Do you have a different system? Is it the, so has your experience been in terms of the advisor advising or? Yeah, there's lots of pop-ups these days when you're online and they go, would you like to chat? Is it that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, I mean, the like web, for the sales. Web, yeah, the web chat services <laughs> that, um... <laughs> uh, I think um, the deputy viewers would try to book a holiday or something, I'm not sure. Yeah, but it's the same system, isn't it? No? I think it, I, I've had similar experience to yourself, but at the end of the day, if you've got an individual that's on the other end and is answering that web chat, there is a different experience to if there is a bot that is answering <laughs> um, the web chat. And our intention would be for the individual to be... Good to talk. Yeah. Uh, that, that is actually, I know, the, the, the kind of humorous part of it, but when I've used web chat for like, technical support for like, mobile phones or, or, or what have you, you're halfway through a web chat, and actually you now just want to speak to the person on the telephone. So, yeah, web chat's as, far as, as good as far as it goes, but after that, as, as long as it's then 
it directed towards speaking to an actual human being as and when required. It's not just used to stop that human contact, which I think was the Stephen McAvoy kind of comment that you were making. So thank you for putting that on the record, Deputy uh, con Convener. I think would some other MSPs wanting in who have been waiting patiently uh, show the Robson MSP. It, it was really just a, a, a thought um, from the conversation previously about how we can overcome some of the frag fragmented services, the ambition to work towards a single financial assessment. I wonder whether some of the data protection changes that have happened may make that more challenging. I'm thinking back to the West Lothian example that was used about uh, analysing and interrogating the housing benefit data but that would be for another purpose. And I just wonder now whether or not they would be able to do such a thing. And I might just want to put that on the record so we could perhaps go back to explore that in a little bit more detail, because I think a single financial assessment would be fabulous. Uh, and I think it, there is a need to deal with some of the very you know, fragmented services, which is not the case everywhere, but there, I think we would accept there is an issue there. But I think data protection may be a significant issue. OK, thank you. Um, Alice Rowan? Yeah, thank you. Just briefly on that point, just an observation about single financial assessments. And again, uh, it, to me, it sounds a very attractive idea. I just wonder whether people here could comment on the fact that perhaps rather than have a, a discussion about that in, in a vacuum, I believe there are some of our European uh, neighbouring countries who probably do something pretty close to that already, and I just wondered if anyone had looked at what they do. Sandra McDermott, yeah. Uh, I'm not aware of anything particular. I've asked my team to start doing some benchmarking to say before we start on a, a journey in Glasgow to try and develop something about a single financial assessment, your point exactly. Uh, is anybody else doing it? Is MD else doing it successfully? Or what, are the barrier, what would the barriers to be that? And I know that you'd asked the question previously, Convener. Um, if this committee was going to take a, a role in trying to drive forward, looking at how we could use the devolved powers and the new Scottish Social Security in line with some of the other benefits, uh, whether it's Best Start Grant or whether it's some of the other benefits like free school meals, uh, school uniforms, or actually... De, uh, welfare benefits. I would be happy to contribute to that discussion. And I think, you know, if we asked other local authority colleagues or other partners to be involved in that, I think it would be really good to get a really strong working group together to drive that forward. Uh, I think there would be a real willingness because a lot of the work that we are doing, albeit it's fantastic work about mitigating the impacts of welfare reform and universal credit, what welfare rights officers across the country are trying to do is fix a broken system that doesn't work for vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to provide is a safety net for those people to get the advice and support they need. And I suppose maybe Karen Carrick would agree that even though that local authorities try to produce reports and outcomes and impact reports of um, the impact of providing financial inclusion services, we pr probably do ourselves a disservice because one of the, the key benefits to providing that, apart from the financial gains and sorting out debts and, you know, making sure people have got money that they need to live on, um, is the prevention of homelessness work. So actually, by that early intervention, stopping Sandra losing her house because she's had a cancer diagnosis or had a heart attack or she's unable to work through mental health or addictions is actually the work we do. And actually, we've never really looked at what are the other benefits that are generated by having really good financial welfare benefit advice about prevention of homelessness and what's the, the cost avoidance then to the public sector of having that there or the fact that you've provided that really good holistic joined up service. Does it stop people's mental health getting worse? Does it improve their social, uh, reduce their social isolation and get them out of the house into the libraries to get that wider support. And just for interest in the committee, since we've set up the Universal Credit Hubs, the visits to libraries in the last six months have went up by 69,000. 69,000. So as well as the other gains that we've got, the financial gains and the really good access to welfare benefits and digital skills, the access to libraries, everybody goes in the library, they're 
encouraged to join the library, but also encouraged to enjoy other uh, to join other community groups or be involved in whatever else is going on in their community, as well as access and benefits and digital skills. And that was one of the unintended consequences, really, of setting them up in the libraries, which has been really good. And maybe just one other point to make to the committee, which is maybe to give our colleagues in DWP some recognition for the good work we've been doing in partnership with them. It's actually Kate that set up the meeting uh, between us uh, to look at what had been done elsewhere. And uh, as a result of that, we've developed a safeguarding pilot in Glasgow, uh, which uh, is due to go live on the 1st of July. I'm uh, delighted. And really, it's only possible because of our colleagues in DWP working in partnership with us. And what we're going to do is give advance notice to DWP that Sandra is really vulnerable. She's got mental health, she's got addiction problems, or whatever that vulnerability is. She won't be able to maintain a 35-hour claimant commitment. And what they'll do is they'll provide additional support. So they'll put me onto the support element of universal credit so that I'm not expected to meet a 35-hour claimant commitment that I'm potentially going to fail and then end up being sanctioned. So we're hoping that we'll either eradicate sanctions for that really vulnerable group or drastically reduce them. So it's just to give our DWP colleagues some credit for really coming to the table and working with us in partnership in Glasgow. And if that model's successful, they've made a, a commitment that it will be rolled out across the rest of Scotland. They're learning from that. That's very helpful. And the agenda item that our committee has once, once this public session is finished is to take stock of what we've heard today and work out what we want to do as a committee. And I think you've mentioned a few times, Sandra, about what assistance the committee can provide. Our deputy Evener mentioned that as well. And what we have to think about is whether we probe or ask questions, whether we scrutinise or whether we see something more proactive about helping mm -hmm. push forward and help, help as a committee to develop and advance things or scrutinise other people to what extent they've improved the situation. If you've got to decide on balance what the committee wants to do, I do want to let other witnesses in, but I'm conscious there's a line of questioning that we've kind of, kind of alluded to, um, but we really should just get on, on the record um, whilst we're still in public session. So I'm, I'm going to make a couple of observations, which are really questions from our brief that we were to ask, but I don't want to ask them as formal questions. We've mentioned already about how the introduction of the, Scot the new Scottish Social Security benefits might impact on welfare advice and support. So we're keen to get things on the record in relation to that. Um, we've spoken a little bit about what the collaborations might look like between Social Security Scotland and providers and welfare rights and advice. Um, the idea of provision of pre-claims advice by Social Security Scotland, uh, how that might impact on existing welfare rights and advice providers. So I'm not asking specific questions about that, but it was something that would be important for the committee, just if you have any thoughts in relation to that. But I suppose finally, um, and the one that we definitely really should ask uh, this morning is, uh, what witnesses expect to see in Scottish Minister's strategy to promote take-up in relation to provision of independent advice services, because they should have that strategy. We will have to scrutinise that as a committee. So that would be a formal scrutiny role that, that we would have. So none of that is a specific question, but we're keen to get some comments or thoughts on the record from witnesses here this morning. Kate Burton. Thank you. Um, picking up Sandra's point, but I'll also just quickly answer your point about um, take up. When you have welfare advisors integrated into GP practices, um, they can actually access medical evidence. They can access the medical records of patients with appropriate consent in place. So it means they can support patients to apply for benefits with the medical information that's needed. So the advisors um, are able to draft medical statements for GPs to check, which means patients get those, or people, get those benefits more quickly than they would if they have to go through a mandatory reconsideration or appeal process um, so but so what I was going to say was is that most of the benefits um, that that people benefit from or, or receive when they're seeing advisors in GP practices are health related benefits so um, DLA and PIP are the two big ones and so actually if you're thinking about a benefit take-up campaign maybe think about targeting the advisors in GP practices or supporting more advisors in GP practices because we, that service can actually reach those people who, who are going to benefit and that will help um, when those new benefits are devolved because there will be more money then in the financial envelope coming, coming to Scotland. 
picking up Sandra's point about unintended consequences of, um, of benefit advice, and Alison Johnson's already mentioned it, the Improvement Service did the social return on investment on advice workers in GP practices, looking at two practices in Edinburgh and one in, in Dundee. And so they measured the impact, they looked at the financial impact of, um, of, of advice on health and, well, health and well-being, on um, GPs, on practices. So we have started to gather some of that additional um, value. Uh, and Sandra can talk. And uh, yeah, Sandra can talk better about it than I. Karen rather can talk better about it than I can. And um, so we have started to gather some of that evidence because it's absolutely crucial. It's not just the financial advice that income makes a difference to people. It's that other stuff that having more money can can bring to people's health and well-being. Okay, thank you. Karen, do you want to? Have I mean, I, th I think I would go back to the point about the new benefits need to reflect what the current system is. So I don't think there's any point in going off and inventing something completely different without thinking about how it integrates to what is exist providing on the ground in the current basis. And I know that discussions have taken place with local authorities about how best these services can be integrated and provided. And they're using that in the different models in different localities that best, again, meet their needs. Um, in terms of take up of uh, independent advice, again, councils have got a key role to play in that. Um, there's lots of innovative ways that councils can promote that using the, the websites they have, which generate a lot of attract a lot of traffic. So I think they are key partners in that process. And if there is that greater connection between local and national government, then that's a very practical way that that can be demonstrated. I would also say, though, I think everybody in this room accepts the benefits of people getting access to advice services. So I'm not sure why, and I say this as an organisation that does research, why we need to keep doing it. We know it works. We know there are benefits to it. I think we probably have now reached the stage of making sure that people actually have access to those benefits. And I would say that there is a key role for politicians in making sure that happens and in the Scottish Government and showing leadership in terms of what we can achieve. Yeah. Now, um, yes, rather me comment, Stephen McAvoy, yes. Um, in terms of the impact that um, the devolution of benefits will have at the, at the front line. Um, I think when you couple that with everything else that's happening, it's likely to be quite significant. Um, I'm quite sad, so I actually counted it, but the Child Poverty Action Group produce a handbook every year which advice workers will use. Um, and comparing the version this year to last, it's actually increased by 90 pages. Um, and it's not an, an insignificant handbook already, so that kind of shows you that as universal credit's being ramped to, complexity is increasing in general. And I think it's important as a recognition that, as well as funding advice, we need to make sure that that funding is stable, so that for people who are experienced in advice, that we can actually retain them. Um, because what you don't want to happen is for short-term funded projects, that comes to an end or gets close to it, and you end up with experienced staff um, who are then leaving services, because once you lose that experience, it's very, very difficult to take somebody who's very, very new to advice and to train them um, to the level that you would have an experienced staff member. When I first started in advice, there was, I think, maybe four or five main benefits. That situation has now exploded. You've got devolution, you've got all sorts of different things happening. So it's just more difficult to actually train people in advice. So it's really, really important that we have stable funding so that we actually retain what we've got. Um, in my experience, there are two main reasons why somebody will contact an advice service. The first one is crisis. So they've had a decision that they don't agree with, they've had a change in circumstances. And at that point, most people will probably go to the, the kind of well-known providers, the local authority, the Citizen Advice Bureau, something like that. But I think also behind that, there are the people who get the more preventative work which is, I think, where you see more of the work with the services that are a bit more bespoke. So maybe somebody based in a GP surgery, where the GPs become culturally quite aware of making referrals. You don't have a direct problem, but have you had a benefit check? And actually making sure that they're getting their benefits maximised before something goes wrong. Um, and I think that's where you start to see a place for services like ourselves, where because we are working daily with um, professionals who work with people who learn disabilities, that becomes part of the culture to get that referral done before there's a crisis. And I think that works really, really important because that can lead to massive financial gains for people. Um, and it's important that we have both sides of that funded. Okay, I think we are getting towards the end of 
of our, our time here because we, 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 we want to discuss as a committee just how we take forward our approach um, um, to this work. So I think my offer to, um, before I make this offer, are there any other MSPs want to, to ask any questions at this stage? Keith Brown? Again, the improvement service, if there's any globally accepted figure for the percentage of take-up of available benefits across the whole piece in Scotland? We don't have that information. We do collect data from local authority funded services in relation to the number of benefit claims that advisors help to be lodged and the outcome of that. But we only started collecting that data last year. We're currently collecting it for this year. So we will be able to give you some information probably early autumn, but at this point in time, we don't actually have that. Mentioned that so I think on pension credits, it's a bit of 60% take-up, which means a 40% not take-up. That doesn't seem too out of the park for other benefits as well, or I suppose it would vary between benefits right enough, but that's a huge amount of resource, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we, we're not, we don't collect that kind of information. What we do is look at it through the lens of advice, so we can say what the successful benefit awards are in terms of... Um, different types of benefits. For instance, um, I know that some of the recent stuff we've got shows that some benefits um, have a 30% success rate in terms of advisor support. Others, it's up about 60%, and we're currently analysing why that might be the case. But in terms of take-up, we don't have that kind of information. And I'm going to ask you one follow-up question as well on, on, on that, that, Karen. But the offer was, before we, before we close this, this public session, if there's a suggestion any of the witnesses want to make to committee or an observation you want to make on any matter loosely related to the themes we've been discussing, please take your opportunity to put it on the public record. We're going to go round the table, but the quick, and we'll start with yourself, Alia. But the question I was going to ask before we give you that opportunity and then we'll close the session is, if I was to ask just for... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, a map of the country and money being invested in advice services, whether it's the UK government, the Scottish government, local authorities, and I get that sometimes the cash can flow between those three, the third and independent sector, and how that varies by local authority, what the trends have been over time in the country. How easy is it to access that, that information? And uh, if it's in my brief, I apologise to Spice that's in my brief and I've missed that, but I didn't particularly see that, because we'll be interested in what the trends are, what the money spent is, what the best structures are, what the best outcomes are. The, the example I would give is Scottish Welfare Fund has underspent some local authorities, massively overspent in other local authorities. So, <coughs> excuse me, we really want to assess not just bean count the money in the system, but actually what the best structures are, but quite good to get some data on that. Karen, I don't know if that it's certainly idea. something that we could help with. Yeah. I, think, I think that would be really helpful for the committee yeah. going forward if we're going to do something meaningful on it. OK, so we are about to, to end this, this evidence session. Um, thank you to everyone, but you do have a final opportunity to make a question, observation, a challenge back to the committee, if you wish, in the future work that we might, we might do. Uh, we'll start with yourself, Alia. Thank you very much. Um, I think, firstly, I just wanted to pick up on the points that Stephen and Kate um, had made in terms of um, the provision of advice within the health sector. Um, and th there's fairly um, well-known research in terms of um, advice by prescription. And, and I think that's something that um, would be useful to look at going forward, particularly in relation to um, benefits that have a health-related impact. Um, we've worked very closely with the Scottish Government as well as the new Social Security Agency um, in terms of gathering evidence and focus groups, then we welcome that opportunity um, going forward so that a lot of the um, observations that have been made today um, can be materialised. Mm. Thank you very much. Kate? Um, I suppose I don't like the word advice on prescription because actually it's about him integrating the advice workers into GP practices and early year services so they are seen as part of the primary care or um, health visiting or midwifery team. So there are no barriers there at all. Um, and that's what I would hope that the committee think about going forward is how can we better integrate advice services in with health settings, particularly um, going forward with the new respons with the responsibilities um, for social security in Scotland, where there is a focus on ill health and disability related benefits. We have at the moment about 100 um, services, advice services, which are integrated into GP practices and early years services across Scotland. But these are being done opportunistically and growing organically 
but actually there is I, I don't feel there is any government support for this there's government support for community link workers for action 15 mental health workers or working in GP practices and they, they the, the big issues for them is actually income maximization for their patients and yet we haven't got welfare advisors in there from a government perspective so I would hope the committee look at that going forward I'm not going to ask that ask the question about integrated joint boards and how they work with all of that but I'll, keep, I'll hold that thought but really interesting a challenge back to the committee so that's very helpful Kate Sandra uh, just thanks to yourself, convening committee, for allowing us to come and give evidence. And I suppose going back to the take-up, for me, again, it would be trying to streamline, automate and have that single financial assessment to strip out the unnecessary waste of uh, completing multiple forms, capturing it once and giving people what they're entitled to would be my ask of the committee. And maybe um, one other kind of specific point, obviously for my role in improving the cancer journey and supporting people with long-term he health conditions, with the new devolved powers uh, for personal independence payment, there's now a requirement uh, for two visits. So one, when you actually um, meet the person, they ha you have to meet them, kind of uh, identify that they're going to make a claim for personal independence uh, payment apply for the uh, the pack the application pack and then you have to once the pack's received you have to go back and do another visit which is stressful for the person with cancer or the long-term health condition that you're trying to support and it also at the time where welfare rights officers time is invaluable because of the demand and increasing demand for services they're having to go out for another appointment and unfortunately, that same system has been replicated with the new Scottish Social Security Agency. So if there's anything that this committee could do to influence that, to have it once and done, to have the packs available, that we could do it uh, when we first visit the person or the first, their first scene, wh whatever settings it's in, whether it's in a partner organisation, a health se service or within the library, that would be hugely uh, supportive. And maybe just one other final point to make, uh, which is maybe a more general one, uh, going back to the briefing. Um, was if we could also keep in mind in committee about the new Child Poverty Act and one of the, the, the duties under the Act, or one of the key drivers of child poverty is making sure that people can access uh, income from welfare benefits and part of that is looking at automation and again it would be hugely uh, influential and a huge driver to help us reduce child poverty if this committee could influence that about the automation of benefits. Also to keep in mind that in work poverty is on the rise and actually in Glasgow 62% of people that are living in poverty come from a household that somebody's working so whatever services are set up or developed in the future has to take cognizance of people that are working that still need that additional support or we're driving them into further uh, poverty and also even though that we know that people in the registered social landlord sector tend to be the ones that we provide that support roundabout quite rightly with welfare rights and housing support. Can we not lose sight of people that live in the private rented sector that don't have that support? So they don't have housing officers and they don't have welfare rights officers aligned to that. So Glasgow's invested particularly to support people that live in the private rented sector in Glasgow because we've got 10,000 people in that sector that are relying on benefits and they don't have the access to a dedicated welfare rights officer. So we've put in some general support, but it's maybe just something else to keep uh, cognising so as you're looking through your deliberations. Okay, that, that's very helpful. And alarm bells ringing in my head when you mentioned the private rented sector, but actually the mid-market rent where people get income shocks and mid-market rent's no longer affordable housing from them and how we support so yeah really really helpful but a specific que request there in relation to new disability assistance replacing PIP could could you email as myself as convener of the clerks very specifically in relation to that okay. I will absolutely look to see how we can take that forward that would be really really welcome uh, Craig well, on that on that score I suppose um, it's worth it's worth mentioning that I've I've spoken to um, our local um, relationship leads um, about a potential proposal in Dundee um, in relation to disability assistance um, and I've put a proposal paper to them um, to work with them in partnership and essentially if, when their new advisors come in into, into post um, to give them a grounding in what existing advice agencies um, do when they're working with people with disabled needs um, essentially showing them how we make claims for the existing benefits, PIP and DLA, um, the needs of disabled people. <clears throat> and essentially, I think there's, um, there's something there in terms of both 
um, preparing those staff for the new disability assistance rollout, but also, as well as that, um, potentially a take-up campaign across the sector um, prior to disability assistance coming into, coming into play. Um, I think what I'd ask the committee, um, and I think you mentioned it in terms of what structure um, potentially works best, and you know, um, witnesses today have given evidence about um, the um, different ways that um, you know we work. We work in GP surgeries, for example. Um, we cover 57,500 patients in Dundee in nine different locations. Um, we also work um, in partnership with our voluntary sector partners through the Big Lottery Fund Dundee Money Action Project, which looks at long-term support for individuals rather than just you know um, firefighting on particular issues. Um, so we can work with an individual for six months to really look at improving their health, their well-being, but also their confidence and reduce stress within their household. Um, I think we've got quite a good partnership working in Dundee, and I think perhaps what the committee might want to consider doing is um, potentially addressing a joint, a letter to the heads of NHS boards, the heads of integrated joint boards, and the heads of community planning to really ask them how they're working, how they're their advice sector agencies are working together and what kind of involvement they, they have in terms of strategically planning those services within their area. Um, we've got, um, I've, I'm working with a couple of the, the major agencies initially um, to try and put in place an advice strategy for Dundee. And I know that that's been successful in North Lanarkshire, um, the work that John Campbell's done um, in pulling that together. Um, and commissioning services in that area. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a, an opportunity for all local authority areas or all NHS health board areas to really you know, answer that question and really potentially put in, plan, in place a, an overarching plan for provision of advice um, going forward. Um, and I'd just like to thank um, you for the opportunity to give evidence today. And I'm glad you get the chance to put that on the record because I understand that's why we do this, that our lines of questioning go off in different directions. You don't always get the opportunity to say what you've came here to say, which is why we do this. Uh, Stephen McAvoy. Um, my post is currently co-funded by Enable Scotland after initially being funded by the Scottish Government via um, Keys to Life. So I suppose my kind of summary point would be in any longer term funding decisions that as well as funding the kind of more mainstream and well-known providers, a realisation that there's also a place for smaller bespoke services that work with particular client groups, not just in terms of the face-to-face -face advice provision, um, but we will be responding to disability assistance consultation. Um, and we will obviously be able to do that with a specific focus on the experience we've had of supporting people learn disabilities through the claim process and how things could be improved. Um, and I think that could potentially be lost in terms of the democratic process and making sure that we design the system right in the first place, um, that various client groups who might otherwise be particularly vulnerable um, can have their voice heard through advice agencies that are there specifically to support them. Thank you very much. Karen Carrick. Um, I don't envy you the next stage of the process. <laughs> I think it's taken so long because advice services and the funding is a very complex landscape. It's so diverse. Um, and I think pulling things together is going to be very challenging even in terms of the Scottish Government, never mind looking at all the other sectors that are involved too. Um, I think Craig's got the right idea about some sort of strategy that can underpin going forward. We've all given you lots of different examples about things that are happening in, in individual areas, and I think it's always helpful to have that in terms of making decisions that um, reflect what works on the ground. But I think also too, maybe it is time to ask the, the question is, what's the purpose of advice? Should it be universal or should it be targeted? What are we doing with it? Why are we doing it? How best can we actually ensure that advice services are delivered collectively across the whole of Scotland? And if I can end by just giving you an example, at the moment we collect data through this performance management framework. And from that we know that 45% um, of service users are single adults under 65%. We know too that 3% um, uh, of service users are pensioners living alone. 
but 14% of the population are pensioners living alone. So we know that pensioners are not accessing advice services as they are currently provided. We know that it's, that it's an effective delivery model in terms of single parents, because we know that 14% of single parents are accessing advice services, yet they only make up 5% of the population. So we've got that kind of data and information. We're quite happy to share that, if that will assist the committee in their deliberations. It certainly will. Um, can I thank all of you for taking opportunities you should do about how the, the committee makes shape will work going forward. We don't feel overwhelmed because the benefit of the committee is we can decide to focus on one or two things. We can never do everything. And we're absolutely clear about the responsibilities in government to actually champion this. But we are keen to scrutinise, but also offer assistance uh, as we go along. Can I thank all of our witnesses again for your, your time here this morning? Uh, that does end agenda item two. We'll stay in contact with you when we take forward our future work in relation to this. But for the moment, uh, we'll say thank you and we'll move to agenda item three, which we'll previously agree to take in private. So we move into private session.